but any type of surgery does carry risks and, and it's not like taking a medication where if, if it doesn't quite work or it gives you a bit of a side effect you can stop it. With surgery sometimes the risks can be irreversible and occasionally they can be devastating. But on the whole this type of surgery is reasonably safe. Transient mood changes and confusion are common after surgery. The risk of having a stroke or a major hemorrhage is very, very small, less than 2 or 3 per cent. The majority of patients that have a mild stroke do get better over weeks or months and it's very, very uncommon to have someone have a major stroke and not have any recovery with time. The biggest risk from my point of view and the thing that we fear the most is infection. Any time you go into hospital there's a risk of infection and any time you have an operation there's that risk and that risk probably is about 3 per cent because we are putting foreign bodies into the human body and those bits of metal tend, the, the bugs tend to like those bits of metal and it's not as easy for the body to clear bugs when you've got metal hanging around. So infection certainly is something that's always uh, in the back of our mind trying to prevent it and identify it early. Seizures are very, very uncommon. I've had a, one patient, uh, one or two patients over the last five years that's had a seizure post-operatively, but nothing in the long term. Um, the chance of dying from the operation is very, very low. The statistically, it's less than 1%. Um, you know, I haven't had any of my patients that have uh, succumbed over the last five years, uh, but that's always something, and, and that's really the bottom line. It, it, this is a risk that you have to be prepared to take if you're going to have surgery, and even though it's extremely unlikely, it's still there. What are the other potential side effects? Well, cognitive impairment. And by cognitive impairment, we mean problems with your thinking, problems potentially with memory, um, problem solving, all of those sorts of issues. And, and that's one of the reasons why we have patients worked up very carefully. We get the clinical, um, we get the neuropsychologists involved to do all of the special testing because we want to know whether what we're going to do is likely to make something like some pre-existing cognitive impairment worse. And so that's one of the reasons why we do that. And if there is significant cognitive impairment preoperatively, then we might say, okay, we're going to avoid a particular target. We're going to avoid the subthalamic nucleus. And we might go and stimulate another target like the globus pallidus internus, which is going to have a lower risk of making that cognitive impairment worse. Softening of the voice is something that, that patients commonly um, notice after surgery and very occasionally it can be problematic but usually it's not so problematic. And depression is something else that we look for. Some of these areas that we stimulate, particularly the subthalamic nucleus, does have significant connections with the parts of the brain that are responsible for the maintenance of a stable mood. And when you go in there and you interfere with one part of the circuitry, Sometimes you can throw other things out of whack a bit and patients can get more depressed and that's one of the reasons why we get reviews by psychiatrists often or a clinical psychologist or both preoperatively because we want to know about that beforehand so that we can take steps to either avoid it postoperatively or to treat it um, so that it doesn't become a problem and depression is usually quite a treatable condition. Richard already went through some of the targets that we um, use for surgery. The subthalamic nucleus has now become the most common target, certainly in, in my practice. Um, the, the thalamus is a great target for patients who predominantly have tremor. The globus pallidus internus or the pallidum uh, is a good uh, target for patients with out of control dyskinesias who might not be suitable for stimulation of the subthalamic nucleus. And another new target which we've done a, a couple of times, and I must say I haven't been all that uh, impressed with the, the results is the pedunculopontine nucleus and this is a, a target that has been touted as a, a great place to stimulate if you want to improve someone's walking or um, their uh, akinesia, or, you know, severe bradykinesia or slowing. Um, some uh, neurologists and neurosurgeons around the world say it, it works great, others say it doesn't work at all. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of sitting on the fence at the moment until we, we have a bit more evidence about that. So the goals of surgery are to reduce these abnormal movements, to improve function, to reduce medication intake, and to improve the quality of life. And that's the bottom line. What we're trying to do is improve quality of life here. We're trying to improve it for 
patient as well as their family. How is surgery done? Well, generally it's done in two operations and so we'll, we'll talk about those uh, here. Often the operations are done on the same day, sometimes they're done a few days or a few weeks apart. But patients that are having surgery will have an MRI scan a few weeks before their operation and that gives us all of the details about the structures within the brain because everyone's brain is a bit different to, you know, your brain will be different to the person sitting next to you. And you've got to, you've got to be aware of uh, what, what the specifics are for that person. On the morning or afternoon of surgery we place one of these frames, it's called a stereotactic frame, and we do a CAT scan. And then we do some planning and we'll go through that. So this is the patient going into the CT scanner and you can see the the frame on the head here, you get a sense of some metal around the head and here. So this is all done out of the operating theatre down in the radiology department. And then we go back up to the operating theatre and uh, we do the planning and we, we select the targets and we have very sophisticated, um, oh, it's, it's like a GPS system, so it, 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 that's essentially what it is, it's a GPS system for the, for the brain and it allows us to, to look at the screen and pick a target and then navigate uh, down to that target in real time. And it, these systems are usually fairly accurate but they do have their limitations. The first operation is generally done with the patients awake. It's very uncommon for us to have to put a patient off to sleep to do deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease. And we make some holes in the, the skull um, and we insert the electrodes and this is the type of apparatus that we we use to put the electrodes in through the holes. During the surgery we do some micro electrode recording so we're recording the, the the brain cells and the signals that are coming from the brain and we also stimulate to see whether we can get a benefit and just as importantly we want to see whether we're getting intolerable side effects because there's no point putting some putting the wire somewhere where someone's getting a good benefit if the side effects that come with that benefit are intolerable. So we want to find a happy balance. Then we secure the wire to the skull using this little cap system and then um, we close up the, the incision and a po patient has a post-operative CAT scan later that day, usually sometimes the next day. Um, we may do the second stage on that day or later.